going to talk just for a little while from the subject, oh, an old school solution to new school problems. An old school solution to a new school problem. Beloved, I would submit to you this morning that being Christian can be challenging and uncomfortable particularly in a world that seems less Christian and even hostile to Christian values. You do recognize that the world is less Christian. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. And you can read. 
repeated on the screen, or you can follow along in your hymn, in your Bible. Let us read together. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. And whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please remain standing as we um, sing together our opening hymn, All the Way My Savior Leads Me, which is hymn number 469 in your hymnal.
Jesus, Jesus, how we love you. Amen. We love you because you first loved us. We love you because you lead us all the way. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity of worship. We thank you, God, that when we woke up this morning, our minds were stayed on coming out to be in your presence with these, your people. We thank you, God, for the many ways in which you blessed us, ways we know, and God, we even thank you for the ways you've blessed us that we have yet to see. And so this morning, God, our hearts are filled with thanksgiving to you filled with praises of your goodness, filled with an attitude of gratitude for how majestic you really are. Our words fail us, God, when we try to say how good you are to us, and yet we cannot stop saying how good you are. So Lord, we come now in this spirit of worship to worship you. You're the only one right now that we want to be pleased with our worship. You're the one we want to inhabit the praises that we lift up. You, oh God, are the one that we want to invite even into your own home and let you have free reign today. Rain down, God. Rain down righteousness, Lord. Rain down, God. Rain down peace for those are, who are in turmoil, God. Rain down, God, and rain down wholeness to those who are broken in any kind of way, Lord. Set free, God. Release, Lord. Bless and give, and then give some more. Forgiving, oh God, seems to be your nature. We love you, Lord. We're grateful for this opportunity in worship. We ask, God, that you would anoint Pastor Victor with everything he needs to give us what we need to hear from you. Anoint the choir, God, so that their voices may lift right up to heaven and carry us away in songs of triumph. God, Please anoint the ushers so that they might be the greeters and the welcomers into this house that you'd have them to be. And Lord, as we worship together and fellowship one with another, we ask that you would anoint even us to your work and to your will today. We believe you, God. You said where two or three are gathered in your name, you'd be in the midst. So we know you're here. And we thank you for coming by. We wait on you now. We trust you and you believe you. In Jesus' name, amen.
us to our own devices, but leads us all the way. I'm supposed to be doing the walk. But I, I, I just feel like we all at home this morning. So I'm, I'm going to be obedient, though. Good morning, Mount Olive. We're so grateful to be in worship with you this morning. And if you are a first-time guest here in Mount Olive, we hope you already feel welcome. But just so that we can see you and know that you're here and thank God for your presence, we're going to ask that you would stand just for a moment. If you're a first-time guest here at Mount Olive, just stand so that we may. Good morning. Amen. Amen. We're glad to we're glad to welcome you this morning. Our ushers are giving you a packet of materials so that you'll know a little more about us. And there's some information in there that we'd like you to fill out, if you would, and leave with the ushers so that we might stay in contact with you since you've been this way. On behalf of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. James E. Victor, Jr., the ministerial staff, our church leadership, and all of our members, we are so thankful to God that he has led your feet this way this morning. And we ask that whatever you need to do in order to have an experience with God, that you would feel free in this space and in this time to do it. We want to welcome as well those who are worshiping with us by way of the internet, watching our live stream. And we want to invite you to come and worship with us in, in person whenever you're in the DMV. Now, Mount Olive, let us all stand and greet one another as we greet our guests.
let us pray. Eternal Thou, in this moment of surrender, we give you our best praise, our best note of gratitude and thanks. We give you our best worship. But God, ultimately, we give you ourselves. So take us, mold us, break us, meld us, reshape us according to the image of your Son, and then use us for your eternal glory. For we are yours, dear God. We are the sheep of your pasture, the flock of your hand. Whatever you choose to do with us, dear God, take away the resistance, remove the doubt, the fears, and allow us to walk humbly with you. Now God, lead us along this way, for we know when you lead us, you will never lead us astray. So now, dear God, let the word today that you have prepared before the foundation of the world meet your people with acceptance and agreement and openness that we might be a changed and transformed people and that we might then leave these hallowed grounds and go and shed the light you have implanted within each of us. Now, Master, hear our prayer for the efficacy of the preaching and the proclamation of the gospel. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray, and the people of God all said together, Amen. Amen. Beloved, it's good to be with you once again. I heard y'all had a tired time in the Lord last week with one of God's dynamic preachers. And so we thank God for such a wonderful and capable staff. And now for the letdown, you get me this Sunday. Amen. Let us turn to the gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter. And there I want to lift up for our sermonic consideration verses 9 through 13 as we undertake a new series in which we explore the meaning of discipleship. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in these 21st century times? So I want us to kick off today with Matthew chapter 9 verses 9 through 13. Hear the lesson as it is recorded and conveyed by the Apostle Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and with his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Thus ends the reading of the word. Amen. I want to talk just for a little while from the subject, oh, an old school solution to new school problems. An old school solution to a new school problem. Beloved, I would submit to you this morning that being Christian can be challenging and uncomfortable particularly in a world that seems less Christian and even hostile to Christian values. You do recognize that the world is less Christian. The world in which we now engage is no longer the world in which many of us grew up in. A world in which every morning in elementary school, 
Before we learned the three R's, reading and writing and arithmetic, the teacher opened with a word of prayer and sometimes even read scripture. The world is less Christian, for the world in which we now live is governed with around-the-clock commerce. And some of you may remember that the stores didn't open up till 12. After church, after other folk got out of church, because we didn't get out till 1, <laughs> and closed at 6. But now there's around-the-clock commerce. Sunday morning was the time of worship and gathering in communities of faith, not a time for soccer practice, yoga, or walking dogs. We're living in a less Christian world. We are the embodiment in some respects of what was said in the movie Concussion, in which the NFL has taken a whole day that belonged to the church. Beloved, we are living in a world yet less Christian than what our forebears knew, yet we are still called upon to be Christian in an environment that is confusing and some would they even say callous. So we ask ourselves, what does it mean to be Christian? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in the 21st century? What does, it, what does it mean to be a disciple in light of Charlottesville and Charleston where the executive office cannot condemn hate and bigotry outright and gives that kind of uh, vituperative and uh, callousness legitimacy? What does it mean to be a Christian when we are battling competing generations that are really classified and characterized by old school and new school realities? What does it mean to be a Christian when the children that you raise no longer want to go to the church that you attend? And we wonder how do we reach them what does it mean to be Christian when the rhetoric of war and aggression are escalating to the near point of no return? What does it mean to be Christian when a priest who preaches the cross and wears a cross used to burn a cross? Do we condemn or do we look at his new life as a radical as the radical power of the gospel to transform individuals lives what does it mean to be Christian these are indeed new school problems problems that we may not have seen seem to not have faced before but can I just hip you to a new reality that many times new school problems are just old school problems with an extended shelf life for, for sin is still sin and, and sin is the oldest game around yes what does it mean to be Christian well beloved when we look at this text we find an old school solution to these new school realities. For here in the passage, we find a man who is confused. And in what would have to be considered an uncomfortable situation, we encounter Matthew today. We don't know if this is Matthew, the writer of the book, or some other Matthew. We just know it's a man named Matthew, Matthew and we know him by his profession. He is the official IRS agent of the Roman Empire. All right, all right. And as such, he is a Jew with a good government job. Come on. Come on. 
But when we dig a little deeper in the context, we discover that he is a despised individual because of the profession which he goes to work with and for every day. A Jew as a tax collector was considered to be a collaborator, a quizzling of the Roman Empire. He was despised because he turned against his own people. And the job of tax collecting was not one that went according to lottery. or It was not one that was, was uh, doled out by the Roman Empire. It was one that was given to the highest bidder. He submitted a contract proposal to betray his own people. Can you imagine going to work every day, taking money from your people who look at you in less than favorable eyes? A man obviously confused, a man who doesn't know what it means to be a part of his own ethnic group and his own religious group, but would rather consider profits and money before his own sense of self and worth. And yet, beloved, there's good news in the text. Because here this man sits at his job taking taxes, cooking the books, taking some for himself under the table, and yet the Bible says that Jesus walked along and saw him in his condition. Can I just give somebody some good news today? That if you find yourself in a confused situation, wondering what it means to be Christian in this world and in this age, Jesus sees your condition. The Lord watches us daily struggling, trying to be faithful, not knowing sometimes what it means to do right, how to do right, what's the right thing to do. Bible says one thing, but practice and society says another. How are we to be Christian? How are we to be faithful disciples? But Jesus gives Matthew an old school answer for a new school problem. And it is a rather simple answer. It is not a complex panacea for the problem, nor is it an elaborate fix for the dilemma. It just is simply a few words. You want to know what it is? Follow me. Uh, that, that's really uh, the issue here. That, that's really the solution to the problem. Follow Jesus. And Jesus calls Matthew from his table for the text says that when he heard the voice of Jesus, he left the receipts on the table. He left the ledger right there at the tax collection booth. He dropped everything to follow the master. Can I just take a parenthetical detour here? Because somebody needs to know that the word of the Lord still has power. He, Jesus didn't call him by the magnetism of his personality. He didn't call him by the look, good looks and the quaff of his care. He didn't call him because of the cult of personality. But he simply called him at his word. And I'm glad today that the word still. I wish I had somebody to help me. The word still has power. The word can still call you from one state of existence to another. Have I got a witness here? Anybody ever been worried and tossed and turned all night long? But I, I heard Jesus say, don't worry for anything. Has anybody ever been assailed by their enemies? And you thought that you were going to go out on the next platform. But, but I heard the word say, fret not yourself because of evildoers. The word still has power to free us and release us to new ways of being. 
He simply said, follow me. Follow me. He did not say, follow your traditions. He did not say, follow your book of prayers or your book of discipline or your constitution or your knowledge of church polity. But follow me. That's what Jesus said. He, he didn't say follow your customs or culture, but simply follow me. You see, beloved, the hallmark of authentic discipleship is not how much money you give in the church, nor is it how well you know your denominational practice or how often you darkened the doors of the church, or how often you attended prayer meeting, or how often you gave, but how well have you followed Jesus? That's, that's what it really means to be a disciple, to simply extricate yourself from the things that bind you and hinder you from following Jesus, lay those down and follow the master. That's what it means to be Christian in the 21st century. It has nothing to do with worship styles, whether you like old school music or new school music, whether you like the service up or down, contemporary or, or traditional, but how well have you followed Jesus? Now I must tell you, beloved, that can be a frightening proposition. Notice the text. Jesus walks by, he sees Matthew, he says to him, follow me. And Jesus doesn't give Matthew one clue where he's going. Y'all ain't walking with me. He didn't say to him, come on, we going down to the store. Let me, let me help. We, we going down to the store. He didn't say, come, we're going on a, on a fishing excursion. We're going on a trip. We're going to see a plate. No, he said, simply follow me. It can be a frightening and surreal proposition to follow Jesus because sometimes when the Lord calls us to obedience and discipleship, he doesn't always give us the clue. But if you can keep your eyes on the prize, if you can follow wherever he leads, then you'll always be in the right state of being the right frame of mind and you'll be in the right place. At the right time. Anybody ever experienced that? That you were just blindly obedient to the Lord's word and you didn't know why you were where you were, but it became evident that you were positioned strategically where God wanted you and the blessing came when you needed it. You were of use when God needed you. God gave you a breakthrough when you didn't think you were going to get anywhere but a breakdown. You were right where God needed you. Following Jesus is always the right thing to do. Can you this day embody that old hymn of the church that says I have decided to follow Jesus. The world behind me, the cross before me. Though no one joins me, I'm still willing and ready to follow Jesus. He simply said to Matthew, follow me. Now, while beloved, I would admit that that is a frightening proposition to which Dietrich Bonhoeffer in The Cost of Discipleship says that that is secure insecurity. I don't know where Jesus is going, but as long as I'm with Jesus, I know it'll be all right. I, I, I don't have to know where he is. I just got to know who he is. 
and that he's in front leading where he will. That's secure insecurity. But, but the text would suggest that there are three places uncomfortable and three people or kinds of people that Jesus might lead us toward. Look here at the passage. Uh, the text says that, that Jesus led them home. He led them to family. It says, while they were in the house, allegedly and presumably this is Peter's house in uh, Capernaum where Jesus hung out off. It's in Peter's house where uh, Peter opened the doors to a motley crew of sinners and tax collectors. But Peter came home and brought other folks to his house. And the whole family was gathered there. I would submit to you that in order to be a good disciple, sometimes you got to deal with your own family in your own house. Lord knows, Lord knows, sometimes it's easier to deal with foreigners and strangers than it is to deal with your own family. Oh, come on here now, don't act like you all that holy and, and everything behind your closed doors is all right. Because if we just look at the statistics and understand our reality, all of us have a drunk uncle somewhere, an addicted auntie somewhere, somebody that's fast tail and loose as she wants to be. Not everything. I don't care how much you come to church. When you get home, it's another story. And sometimes it's easier to deal with other folks than it is to deal with your own family. But you see, beloved, you got to have a portable religion. For when you meet Jesus, you need to be able to take him home. I would contend that part of the problem is we meet him in the sanctuary. We sing hallelujah with loud voices. We lift high holy hands. But as soon as the benediction is over, we fail to take him home. But if you're going to be a real disciple, you need to take the Lord home with you. And you need to be the same person in church that you are at home. You're going to be a disciple. You're going to have to deal with your family at home. The second group of folks that, that Jesus might lead us to encounter, which could be uncomfortable, is a fellowship of misfits. The text here says that, that when they got to the house, that there were other sinners and tax collectors. Now, of course, one might expect that a tax collector would hang out with other tax collectors. That's not uh, an unusual proposition. For often, lawyers will hang out with lawyers. Doctors hang out with lawyers. Preachers hang out with preachers. We love to talk shop. And it's good to have the fellowship of somebody that knows the lingo and the language of your profession. But here, the text says that there's an all-encompassing blanket of sinners. That means Everybody else that's got something wrong with them was up in the house. Y'all right, right, right. ain't feeling me here. Because you see, our problem is we are so exclusivist and separatist that we like to have good folks, well folks, 
folks that can give big money. But the, the test of authentic discipleship is when the lost sinner comes. Is there a place in the house? We are so isolated and have such separatist, separatist tendencies that we forget that we are called to the misfits. The sign of a healthy church is not whether the who's who goes there. sign of a healthy church is not whether an A-list clientele visits with regularity and frequency but can somebody that's been broken down beaten by the world despised and rejected find a place in the house I'm not so much concerned about who's who, but I want to know can somebody who's been beaten up by the world find Jesus in the house. Authentic disciples recognize our biases and grapple with them. Now, you got to be honest with yourself. You got some biases. Uh -huh. you, you got some shop gear mentalities. We don't want certain kind of folk around us. But you see, beloved, if you're going to follow Jesus, he will take you to the folk you don't really want to deal with. The folk that you despise the most will be the ones that he requires you to confront your biases toward. Help me, God. Help me. So some folk don't like people with tattoos. And the person that sits next to you on the plane tatted up everywhere. You don't like certain kind of ethnic people and they move next door. And now you got to be neighborly in your neighborhood. See, authentic disciples follow Jesus to a band of misfits. And truth be told, if you really want to be honest, you just as much a misfit as the folk that you don't like. Which leads me to my final point. Here, Jesus leads Matthew to a flock of the familiar. It says, there in the house sitting at the table were tax collectors, sinners, watch this, and his disciples. In other words, they were just fixed misfits. You see, you need not be all condescending and act like you better than somebody just because you found Jesus yesterday and now you want to be all holy. The only difference between you and anybody else is that the Lord has fixed it for you and is still fixing it for you and you just hadn't been declared a misfit. And the last thing that anybody that comes to the household of faith needs is another sinner looking the sinner in the face as if they got something special that you don't have. But I need to tell you the same grace that fixed you is the same grace that'll fix somebody else. The same love that turned your life around is the same love that'll pick somebody else up 
the same mercy. That allowed you to progress yeah. is still available oh, yeah. to the one the who Lord. needs it the most. Yeah. So the answer to many of our problems, beloved, is simply to follow Jesus. Yeah. Not our traditions, not our customs, not our culture but to faithfully engage the word of God to find out what is the will of God. Follow him. And that I need to tell you is frightening, but it's also dangerous. Because the text here says that when all of those that were in the company of Jesus around the table in Peter's house were there, Pharisees saw a new reality. Sinners, tax collectors, and a holy man who was a Pharisee sitting all at the same table, which bucked their customs and defied their conventions. And they, the Pharisees that is, not having the courage to ask Jesus directly, pulled on the coattail of James and John or Matthew or Peter and said, why does your master eat with tax collectors and sinners? And beloved, when you begin to live out your discipleship, there will be those who ridicule you and who ostracize you and marginalize you for living out boldly your faith in the world. Put your arms around someone of a different orientation and see if you still have the same friends. Begin to talk about loving the love those that are least to be loved in the society and embracing those that have been despised and rejected and see if you still get invited to the same parties and office affairs. No, beloved, it is a condition in which the Pharisees will object. But Jesus said, and this is where we find good news, I did not come for those that were well. But I came for sick folk. Sick folk need this kind of embrace. Sick folk don't need rules and regulations. They need love, mercy, forgiveness, acceptance. And come not for the well, but I'm come for those who are sick. You see, beloved, you may encounter the rejection, but here's the beautiful part of the passage. I'm always glad that Jesus has the last word. Right. While the Pharisees object, Jesus said, go back According to one translation, go back and read your Bible again. Because you missed the mark by being separatist and elitist and exclusionary. Go back, read your Bible. Turn to Hosea 6 and 6 where it says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You see what the Pharisees forgot was that mercy trumps everything in the, in the kingdom of God. And beside that, their practices were already obsolete. For at the time of the writing of the text, the temple had already been destroyed. There was no longer any animal sacrifice. And yet they were holding on to a dead tradition. But Jesus said, I desire mercy not your platitudes, 
not your customs, not your tra traditions, but I desire mercy. Thanks be to God that mercy is always the last word. I'm glad that the Lord always has the last word. When people have despised you, mercy had the last word. When folks thought that you would never amount to anything, mercy had the last word. When people rejected you for who you were, mercy had the last word. When they wouldn't let you in, mercy had the last word. When they talked about you, mercy had the last word. When they scandalized your name, mercy had the last word. When they said you weren't qualified, even though your CV showed that you were superior candidate, mercy had the last word. Thanks be to God that Jesus always has the last word. And the last word is mercy. Thank God for mercy. Do I have any travelers? Anybody here thankful for his mercy? You ought to thank God for grace. For grace is when you get what you don't deserve. But mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. I deserve death. But thanks be to God for mercy. I deserve to be put out. But thanks be to God for mercy. I deserve my whipping. But thanks be to God for mercy. For mercy suits my case. Anybody here thankful for his mercy? Mercy. Not ordinary mercy. Not generalized mercy. But Specialized mercy. Mercy that meets me on the road of existence. Mercy that suits my case. Mercy that's tailor made for me. Praise be to God and thank God for mercy. 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 My grandmama, sometime when we would act up and we get on her nerves, I mean her last nerves, she'd just simply look up, put her hand on her hip, and say, Lord, have mercy. I didn't know what she meant then, but the older I get, I understand that every now and then, you need to be like my grandmama. Just put your hand on your hip and look up to heaven and just say, Lord, have mercy. When the president acts a fool, Lord, have mercy. When this world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket, Lord, have mercy. When your children act up on you, Lord, have mercy. When the disciple disappoints you, Lord, have mercy. When you don't seem like you're going to make it from one day to the next, Lord, have mercy. And there's something about pleading mercy. Mercy always comes down just when you need it most. Do I have a witness here that the Lord will show up and show out right on time? Is there anybody here today that needs to say, Lord, have mercy Lord have mercy I've been through the storm but Lord have mercy I've been through the night of the soul but Lord have mercy I don't know how I'm going to make it but Lord Have mercy. And the last word of God is always mercy. And so there may be somebody here today whom the world has placed on its no admissions list. 
you've been blackballed in a blackout. Colin Kaepernick ain't the first one to experience that. But I submit to you today that mercy is still available. For as truth endureth to ever, every generation, and his mercy is everlasting. If there's someone here today that needs the benefit of the beneficence of God and God's mercy, let me invite you to come walk down this aisle today into a new way of life. Your family life may not be that great at home. You may be a part of a band of misfits. You might even be a church full of misfits. But mercy is still available to you. And God's mercy has the last word. The Pharisees had a word for Matthew, but Jesus had the last word. Go back and read your Bible for mercy is the final word. And no one has the final word on your life but the mercy that we receive spoken by the Lord Jesus Christ. So if there is one today that needs that mercy, we invite you to come. Cast your lot among the people of God. This is not a moment for prayer and for prayer requests. This is the time for decision. Authentic decision, authentic discipleship. Will you follow Jesus? Can you drop the symbols of your comfort and your success and your status in order to follow the master? It takes mercy, it takes grace. But mercy and grace empower and enable us to make that decision and then to live faithfully thereby. So if you are here today and you are without a church home, without a relationship with Jesus Christ, we encourage you to come. And there may be those of you here today who have experienced the rebirth and know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you've been born again. But you would like now by the prompting of the Holy Spirit to unite with the Mount Olive Church, we invite you also to come to seek membership among this body called Mount Olive Baptist Church. If you're here today, we invite you to come by Christian experience or by letter. The decision is now yours. Whomsoever will, let him come. Let her come. Let them come. Whomsoever, I'm glad we got such a broad spectrum of possibility. Because whomsoever touches just about everybody. Doesn't matter where you've been, who you are, who you did it with, how you did it. Whomsoever is big enough to include you. So we invite you to come as the choir sings. Will there be one today that will make a decision for Jesus Christ.